I'm Rob Bell, an engineer with a thirst for understanding how things work. Join me on a journey to investigate the incredible structures that have stood the test of time and their ground during what was to become a global war. Nineteen forty, following the fall of France and the devastating defeat at Dunkirk, Britain stood alone against the onslaught of the unstoppable Nazi menace. With her back against walls not yet built, construction began on an epic project, transforming this green and pleasant land into an impregnable island fortress. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Churchill's rousing speech of defiance laid out the plan for Britain's defence. Each week, I'll be exploring the streets, hills and landscape he spoke of to uncover the monumental, mysterious and heroic buildings that helped us win the war. Today, nearly 80 years later, thousands of seemingly random structures still litter our countryside. In many cases, they're just blocks of concrete you might see during a daily commute or pass by on a weekend walk. But if you know what you're looking at, behind these remnants of bricks and mortar, there's a much darker story to be told. It's a tale of terror and fear. At a time when fascism overran the rest of Europe, Britain stood alone. Today, often all that's left to remind us of those dark days are these crumbling remains. But in their day, they were the buildings that fought Hitler. Today, I'm in the south of England, home to the town and city buildings that stood right in the line of fire. If the Germans succeeded in breaking through our coastal and stop-line defences, it was on these streets another bloody battle would begin. As an island nation rich in resources and commanding a strategic position, Britain had always been a target for foreign invasion. There were the Romans, the Saxons and the Vikings, but the successful conquest by the Normans in 1066 was the last. Since then, many had tried. There was the Spanish Armada and Napoleon, but Britain held firm. A combination of naval strength, geographic location, and the good old British weather kept our shores safe from foreign invasion for nearly a thousand years. But by 1940, everything had changed. Hitler's crack air fleet, the Luftwaffe, threatened domination from the skies. The Germans had set their sights on clearing the way for an epic land invasion, smashing their way inland to conquer our cities and industrial heartlands. Once the invasion came, it would have been down to the integrated defences known as stop lines to hold up any German advance hopefully giving time to our depleted and poorly armed reserve forces to engage the enemy in areas of our choosing. But they could have only held out for so long. Then our cities would have been the next target. I think there was a genuine and absolutely justified fear of air raids as a defenceless civilian population is basically eradicated from the air by people who never see the people they're killing. This is a new form of warfare, and it's a form of warfare that the politicians know is actually capable of defeating a country, because it's going to kill morale. Because if you know that every time you go to bed, your, your family could be obliterated. And they cause terror. 
A major challenge in keeping our cities safe was the vast growth in urban sprawl. The Industrial Revolution had caused a boom in the economy, and with that, our buildings had grown up and out, spreading for miles. London was one of the greatest challenges, and its best hope for protection lay in the surrounding landscape. Box Hill is the highest summit on the North Downs. The North and the South Downs were part of the natural defences, rather like the stop lines you'd see all across Great Britain. These were the valleys, they were the steep hills, they got that firm chalk bed that provided some of the natural defences for the outer lines of defence around London. And it was here, using the lay of the land, that the British Army set to work, constructing a barricade of defences to protect our capital city. As part of a nationwide defence programme to block the enemy on the warpath, this critical site ran along the southern slopes of the North Downs, from Surrey all the way to Kent. They were part of a vast network made up of pillboxes, trenches, barbed wire, to prevent the Germans from spreading out and roaring across the country just as they did in northern France. The Germans would have mounted terrible reprisals. Um, so you would have seen, you know, your average sort of British village, you know, being kind of torched and all its inhabitants being, you know, executed uh, if any, you know, resistance activity was detected in the area. Despite the threat of terror, the defence buildings tasked with repelling the enemy from London's outer fringes were a stroke of genius. So these were a combination of natural obstacles, so canals and rivers and railways, for example, and then they would be supplemented by man-made obstacles. We're standing right on the bank of the, uh, the River Mole. Here it's quite fast flowing and it's a natural anti-tank ditch. So over here, it's not easy to see, but there are some concrete pillars sunk into the riverbed. Now, they have a matching pair on our side of the river, and they were joined together by a large chain, which would prevent anything coming up the river, and including tanks. Had German tanks succeeded in ploughing across the riverbed, heading inland towards our city streets, then a far greater threat awaited them on higher ground. What we're looking at is an anti-tank position, and the whole point of that is it could cover an anti-tank ditch which has been dug from one side of the Dorking Gap to the other. Now, the chaps are in here. Once the attack came underway with the Germans coming up from the coast, you can't get out of here. You, by the time you've climbed up behind you, you're going to be shot down. You are in here. This is a forlorn hope. The men prepared to fight until the very end were often the same men who built the defences. And beneath the rugged exterior lies the real secret of these impressive structures, innovation. This position is unique. It's uh, an infantry pillbox. In other words, the soldiers in here would not have an anti-tank gun. They would be armed with Lee Enfield rifles of basically first world vintage and the light machine gun. As you can see, it's corrugated. And what's happened here, the base has been laid. This is done by one gang. Another gang would come in and put the shuttering up. Another gang would pour the concrete. And again, another gang would come along and put the roof on. These were people who, uh, basically, there was no unemployment in the summer of 1940. If you were all signed on the labor exchange as unemployed, this is what you end up doing, building pillboxes. Inside this pillbox, there is a piece of shuttering made out of the same concrete, and this is designed, if a bullet should go in, it can't ricochet around, it hit that, otherwise it's gonna cause a lot of death and destruction for the men inside. Like all the defense buildings, the infantry pillbox had one major drawback. British concrete was made with lime, and that made it highly visible to enemy planes. You had to be very careful uh, when these were being built. You would never follow the same path in. You would always be under trees. Try not to leave tracks, which could be easily seen. And it would have had a camouflage net over. 
The Luftwaffe photographic reconnaissance came over here on a regular basis. Maps that were captured show all these pillboxes, um, even searchlight units. So however well we camouflaged them, they did in fact know exactly where we were. The Luftwaffe may have known the location of our defensive armaments, but there was no guarantee they could have got past them. In what became a building frenzy, fast unfolding across the country, these structures were seen as vital to save our towns, cities and seaports. Back in the capital, the government needed to carry on, keeping control of these defences and coordinating the war. During 1940, preparations were being made to ensure governance even if the Germans invaded. And whilst these defences never saw a ground assault, they would be sorely tested by the biggest aerial bombardment Britain had ever faced, the Blitz. Whilst Hitler may have been conducting plans for global domination beneath tons of concrete, as ever, things in Britain were a little more basic. In London in 1938, located beneath the Treasury buildings, a group of Whitehall offices began to be repurposed to serve as a meeting space and command centre for the War Cabinet so that they could continue operating in the event of air raids or attacks. They were to become the famous Cabinet War Rooms, Britain's operational nerve centre throughout the war. Whitehall, Westminster, central London. 12 feet beneath office workers and city pedestrians, plans were underway to convert basement offices into an underground bunker. It was here that Winston Churchill and his inner circle would plot the route to victory. But before moving in, essential work was needed to make it safe. What made it attractive is it had a steel frame. So this was felt to be very strong. But what people hadn't factored in is they'd also built in a series of courtyards in the middle of the building. So that if a bomb had fallen and hit the courtyard, it would have gone straight to the roof of the basement. And so it was a strong building, but it also was vulnerable. So what Britain did is it began to strengthen what was a regular basement. First with wooden trusses and beams, then they put in metal girders, and then finally, in 1940 itself, trying to make it as strong as possible, they put in a three-foot concrete layer known as the slab, and that extended all the way back over all the offices of the Cabinet War Rooms by that stage. The concrete slab was inserted between the basement ceiling and the ground floor. Laid in 14 stages, each layer had a slightly different structure and composition. One of the most essential rooms to undergo reinforcement was the map room. The map room is the beating heart of the whole establishment. It's the most important room. It kept a current record of the war. It was up to date every minute. It was constantly changing the maps, keeping a record of exactly what was happening in the war. And it was very much state of the art up to date. It was absolutely crucial to everybody who worked at the highest levels of strategic conduct of the war. The war rooms became fully operational on the 27th of August, 1939. One week later, Britain declared war on Germany, triggered by Hitler's successful invasion of Poland. The task to defend our nation was daunting. I think the government's absolutely terrified that the British are going to lose their morale because of enemy bombing. I think that it's one of the greatest challenges the government's facing. Uh, because what, what, what can they do? They, what, how can they defend it? You know, they can put up some searchlights, they put up some anti-aircraft guns. You know, they can, they can tell the fighters to try and shoot down these bombers. Uh, they can try and make sure that this new technology, this new sort of radar stations, these early warning stations. But in the end, you know, they know that the bombers will probably always get through. Creating the cabinet war rooms was a daring manoeuvre. An enemy target, hidden in plain sight. But converting an old and already established building had its limits. 
It was never bombproof, but people who worked down here felt safe. It was made up as we went along, it was strengthened, and it was good enough, and that's all we needed. Because Britain didn't seek a war in the 1930s, it hadn't laid down plans. It hadn't got deep, concrete air raid shelters put in place. And what it did is it worked out what it needed to survive, built it, and got on with it. It was never completely secure. The first bomb to drop on London in World War II fell in August 1940, by which time the Battle of Britain was well underway. Believing the Royal Air Force to be close to defeat, the German Luftwaffe switched to military and industrial targets around London and in other parts of Britain. I think the German bombing uh, tactics kind of developed over time. I think originally it was, it was fairly indiscriminate. I don't think it was as tactical as it should have been. Then you have this kind of a weird form of tourism, which they're following these German guidebooks to Britain and going, well, we'll visit that city tonight. After a while, it starts getting a, a, a little bit more targeted. Bomb the industry, bomb the docks. It's a kind of evolving campaign. Although the government might have felt safe and secure beneath the reinforced concrete of the cabinet war rooms, for the majority of the population, there was little respite. But again, in the principle of make, do and mend, one of the most popular and surviving structures from the time can still be found up and down the country, often in people's back gardens. The humble but effective Anderson shelter. An Anderson shelter, very clever. You know, they're sectional, corrugated iron air raid shelters dug into your garden. They said you'd have to have about a foot of earth over the top. Some people had a bit more. And there were complicated diagrams to show how you could stack people up inside. The Anderson shelters were the brainchild of Sir John Anderson, head of air raid precautions. They were first rolled out in 1939 to protect civilians most at risk from aerial bombardment. Three million kits of galvanized steel, spanners and bolts were eventually distributed across cities nationwide. London was once home to Joan Longley, who remembers her family's Anderson shelter well. When the war started, I was three and a quarter years old. And when I it finished, I was eight. But there are two sides to the Anderson shelter. It was a safe place to be when everywhere outside was nasty. And when the bombing was quite quiet, it used to become our playhouse. But a lot of the time, of course, during the war, we were in the dark because we weren't allowed any lights at all at night time, no torches, nothing. It was pretty cold in there and no heaters, you see. We used to snuggle into blankets and things. Up to six people could hunker down in an Anderson shelter. By digging the structure deep into the earth, its walls and ceiling made of corrugated steel sheets had the rigidity needed to withstand relentless bomb blast. As well as an Anderson, another shelter designed for urban areas was also a lifesaver. People that had a back garden, you're great, but if you live in an industrial area, lots of terrace streets with only a backyard, you've got nowhere to put an Anderson shelter. And that's why they introduced from 1941 the Morrison shelter that people could use in their home. It is in effect a reinforced metal box with wire sides that you could fit mum, dad, and the kids inside there. And that was pretty good too. Bolted together in the style of a table, the Morrison had high tensile steel legs, wire mesh sides, and a heavy steel plate an eighth of an inch thick on top. Built to withstand debris from the collapse of up to two floors from above, the nation's city dwellers could sleep easier, until a brutal turn of events changed everything. After losing the Battle of Britain in September 1940, and as a result, their daylight air supremacy, the German Air Force, or Luftwaffe, dramatically and devastatingly changed tactics and embarked on a systematic nighttime mass aerial bombing campaign against Britain's industrial targets, towns, and cities. This terrifying time became known as the Blitz. 
and London became the primary target. Consecutive raids on the capital, night after night. Sometimes it would only be a few casualties, tens. On another night, it's hundreds. But during those 50-odd nights, from September 1940, the casualties amounted to about 12,500 in total. The Blitz caused widespread devastation. It was designed to undermine our morale, but it had more of an impact on our bricks and mortar. About 60% of the bombs that were dropped on Britain landed in London, so huge devastation, and they were targeted in particular parts of London. So it was the East End, Bermondsey, for example. I think about 9% of houses survived the, the Blitz. I think it's difficult to underestimate how frightening being caught up in an air raid would have been hearing maybe the crump of, of bombs falling around you, not knowing whether your house had been hit or whether family and friends had been killed. So it would have been hugely dislocating and frightening to be caught up in that. And of course, London experienced that on a nightly basis. As well as London, the Luftwaffe attacked the main seaport cities of Liverpool and Hull. Bristol, Plymouth and nine other urban areas were targeted, including all our industrial centres. Forty-three thousand civilians were killed in the Blitz, and an estimated one-fifth of the country's housing was damaged. Until well into the war, city casualties outstripped those in the military. And so, understandably, facing such a horrific onslaught every night, many members of the public sought alternative accommodation. I'm in the south of England, exploring the daring designs and steadfast structures that protected our citizens during World War II. From small but impressive shelters, to secret underground bunkers, they all made their mark. But perhaps the most indelible are those that transformed already complex frameworks into places of safety. From the end of 1940 through into 1941, from dusk until dawn, city dwellers across the country faced the unbearable threat of nighttime bombing raids, known as the Blitz. Civilian casualties eventually numbered over 50,000. The bomb blast damage to our streets left permanent scars on our cityscapes. I think the legacy of the Luftwaffe's bombing campaign is in just about every major city in Britain. London, Portsmouth, Southampton, Exeter, Glasgow, Liverpool, you walk down most streets in the centre of, or any parts of those cities, and you're thinking, well, hold on, there's a terrace there, and right in the middle of it, there are about you know, 20 houses worth of, of, of modern buildings or buildings built in the 50s and 60s. So I think that, yeah, it, it's all around you, and I think it's, it's very easy to forget today really how badly these cities were pasted. In its worst week, Liverpool and the rest of Merseyside was hit by 870 tonnes of high-explosive bombs. And in the capital, one out of every six Londoners was made homeless, with over a million dwellings destroyed. But the humble Anderson shelter proved its worth. And you'll have noticed the point of this picture already. A bomb has fallen, a house has collapsed, but the Anderson shelter, a few yards away, protected its occupants. All were safe. So there were huge social disparities in, in London. Obviously, there were some people who had large houses and large gardens. They'd be able to build their own Anderson shelter. There were other people that were living in flats. In Glasgow, obviously, in tenement flats. So they would be having to go down to a, a, a communal public shelter. And these had pretty unsanitary conditions, so were kind of deeply unpleasant. Public shelters on the streets were either adapted from railway arches or basements in shops and cinemas or they were purpose-built, the most common version being the 50-person public shelter. Over 6,000 of these concrete blocks were built in Leeds alone. Back in London, many of the communal surface shelters were hastily built, affording little space or protection. 
which is why any shelter below ground was quickly commandeered if deemed fit for purpose. So initially, the government were loath to allow people to use the underground stations. There was a real fear of a kind of deep shelter mentality taking effect. But you couldn't prevent people buying a platform ticket and then just not coming up again. Um, so the people basically took over these London underground um, and eventually the, the government relented um, and they increasingly you know, equipped them with, with bunk beds. So this was one mechanism in which the, the, the state was kind of trying to protect um, the, the, the people. Another was the construction of these kind of deep shelters across London that were often about 150 feet underground that was offering some kind of protection. Deep level shelters were planned to run alongside some of London's underground network. Able to accommodate up to 8,000 people, each site had a pair of parallel tunnels five metres wide, 400 metres long and subdivided into two decks. Crammed with bunk beds, canteens and washing facilities, they had everything needed and were designed so that after the war, they could be cleared out and then linked together to form an express tube line. That plan never materialised and all were eventually converted for various other uses, such as storage. Only eight of these ambitious deep shelters were completed during the time of the Blitz leaving most civilians seeking shelter on any station platform they could find. I can't imagine a worse place to spend the night than the London Underground during the Blitz in 1940. Um, you know, the one thing you may have noticed about the London Underground and most underground uh, uh, networks around the planet is that they don't have toilets. So, you know, there's really not a lot of place to go to the loo in, in, in the middle of, say, Piccadilly Underground Station in the middle of the war. So they're, they're pretty nasty places. They've got rats, they're dirty, they're smelly, they're a bit airless. You're, you're, you're sleeping next to complete strangers. Um, I think they are a place where uh, you, you feel very vulnerable with your family and everyone's trying to grab their own little scrap of platform. And I think you've got to be there because you're either going to be in this kind of fetid tunnel or you're going to risk being obliterated by a bit of German high explosive. It takes your choices. Understandably, the population in many of Britain's cities didn't feel safe, either in their own back gardens or in communal shelters. And so, as a result, thousands would self-evacuate every night out into the countryside, either to sleep in their cars, out under the stars, or in repurposed caves like this one. that people desperately needed. They were fitted with electric lighting, 
but installing any waterworks proved almost impossible in whole swathes of this vast underground city. They did try to run a, a water supply into the caves, but they were only able to do that in the very earlier sections. Further back into the system, gravity just would not allow it, so they had to bring it in through a bucket. There was an area that you could wash up, it just wasn't like being at home. It was more like a bucket of soapy water and a sponge. Some people that still went to their homes that had not been destroyed chose to do their cleaning up there and then come to the caves for the evenings to shelter. But there was an option and it was available for people here. A ventilation system was needed to ensure enough fresh air and oxygen moved through the cave. But making use of the tunnels already in existence meant much of what was installed was inadequate. This is a very small tunnel. It's probably about 60 metres long. It's an escape tunnel. And they put a fan over here so that they could ventilate the place. 15,000 people, it stunk. It wasn't the most comfortable of places, but it was highly effective and organised with military precision. With that many people, rules had to be put into place. There is not a record anywhere to be found of anyone being thrown out of the cave system during the war. Simple rules and the fact that if you did lose your pitch, you were back up top where the bombs were. Although the civilian population was taking the brunt of the brutal Nazi aerial attack, this wasn't a country cowering in caves. By maximising the minimal resources available, we were looking for ways of fighting back. And one of the first methods of doing this was to use guile and subterfuge to stop the bombs even hitting our cities in the first place. The cost of the Blitz can never be underestimated. Although it became a part of everyday life, the reality is incomprehensible today. But against the odds, it didn't demoralise our population. And as a result, it's not for nothing that the Blitz spirit survives on as such a strong sentiment today. Back in those dark days when communities had to come together, it was all about overcoming phenomenal adversity, death and destruction. In every week of the air war, hundreds of civilians are killed and injured in the cities of Britain. From their suffering is born a grim resolve to fight back and keep fighting until the enemy is completely destroyed. I think that people were brought together by a common enemy. I think people did feel a sense of, you know, reciprocity, if you like. You know, if you're all going to be bombed, it kind of brings you together. And I think there was also showing this idea of shaking your fist up at the skies together and, 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 and saying, you know, you know, up yours, Adolf. I think that there was that kind of spirit. We're not going to be cowed by this and we're going to look after each other. During the first month of the Blitz, the German Luftwaffe jettisoned 5,300 tonnes of high explosives on London in just 24 nights. Despite our stoic attitude, it was clear an urgent solution was needed to defend all our built-up urban areas. Blackdown in Somerset is home to an ingenious set of structures. This unassuming terrain hosted a little-known but highly inventive bombing decoy, built as part of the defences for Bristol. Codenamed as a starfish site, it was one of around 230 installations that saved numerous cities from total obliteration. Starfish sites began after the bombing of Coventry. It's November 1940. The idea being that they wanted to do anything to try and keep these German bombers away from the important cities. The raid that hit Coventry on the 14th of November 1940 was devastating. 4,000 homes were destroyed. 200 separate fires raged out of control. 
Now the idea was using people who had worked in circus, in theatre, in film, and magicians. Maybe you can deflect the bombers away from that city at night. The key was that these were used at night. They did things like create streets with lamps and they would have banks of area that they could set on fire that would probably have a mixture of creosote and water that could look like small fires started by incendiaries. These starfish sites, they were sighted normally four miles from the target and they were kind to locals and they tried to keep them at least one mile from the nearest village or settlement. And there were some people, you know, under wartime restrictions, didn't travel very far and they never knew that such a site was nearby. It was very, very clever. Around a thousand different types of decoys were built on more than 600 sites across the country, but only around 230 of them were starfish sites using lights and fires, and none more impressive than this. This site on top of Blackdown here was the most complex and biggest decoy city in England. Bristol City on Blackdown. An RAF crew would operate huge rear stats to dim and s uh, turn out the lights and so on, and could represent a poorly blacked out street, traffic lights, the sparks from um, trams that were going along. The uh, whole operation here was controlled from Lower Farm, where a sergeant in the RAF would be on telephone communication with the RAF HQ. And from there, there was a landline or field telephone to the bunker. The bunker is one of two remote shelters from where the lighting and fire decoys were triggered. Standing on the southern boundary of the decoy site, this earth-banked brick building with walls 35 centimetres thick rests on a concrete raft nine metres long. Its outer blast wall protects the single entrance. This is the bunker where the airmen would have done their duties at night. Uh, over in the corner, a nice stove to keep them warm in the winter. Up there in the ceiling, there is an escape hatch because after all, these guys were inviting the Germans to come and bomb them. The glimmer of city lights had always been the pathfinder for enemy planes seeking to narrow in for a direct hit on their metropolitan target. So it was vital the real city of Bristol lay hidden in a blanket of darkness. In a blackout directive issued right at the start of the war, windows and doors had to be covered with heavy curtains, cardboard or paint, and streetlights were switched off, dimmed and shielded to deflect the glow downwards. Any chink of light visible from the streets would initiate a knock at the door from an air raid warden or a policeman. Total darkness was the only way in which the decoy city could work its magic. When the bomber fleet started to arrive, they would estimate where it was going, and then, if required, it set the lights going at just at the right moment. Timing was essential, because the lights had to be turned out just too late to give the bombers their direction. Having lured the enemy in with lighting decoys, next would come the fires. A pyrotechnic showstopper designed to replicate the raging flames that German pilots would expect to see having struck their target. Each fire was built in a designated area and surrounded by a firebreak trench to contain it. To make it look like the real thing, a bombed out city, there were different fire types, different durations of burning, and different speeds of ignition. Fires were operated electrically, ignited electrically, and they were in big iron baskets with lots of fuel. And they also had these troughs of flaming creosote into which they put water, because as people know, if you throw water into a burning fluid or fat in particular, uh, you get a large flare which imitates the incendiary bombs. Later on, they discovered that uh, if they hung a roll of roofing felt over one of these fires on a piece of rope, 
That would catch light and eventually the rope would burn through. And as the roofing felt fell into the fire, it imitated a, a collapsing roof. Other illusions in the decoy's box of tricks included mobile smoke generators for burning buildings, carbon arc lamps under waterproof glass domes for intense flashes like bomb detonations, and red down lighting shining onto sand to create dumped out coal embers from steam engines. So the question is, did they work? And it's true to say that nearly 1,000 tonnes German ordnance was ditched on starfish sites all around the UK. In total, 81 towns and cities across the country relied heavily on decoy sites like Black Down to ensure their survival. But for many living in urban areas, life would never be the same again. So if people emerged from their underground tube station or the Anderson shelter or their public shelter to find that they'd been bombed out, that their house had been um, damaged beyond belief, uh, then they would uh, go to the Women's Voluntary Service, the WVS, who would try and equip them with um, coupons to be able to buy new clothes because obviously all of their possessions would have gone and they would have tried to find somewhere for them to um, to go and live uh, for, on a temporary basis. Um, so we've got huge dislocation. Um, there are about 60 million changes of address uh, in Britain during the Second World War. And obviously some of that is to do with evacuation. So um, children being evacuated or women being conscripted and, and moving to different parts of the country. But also a large proportion of that is people being bombed out of their houses and having to move elsewhere. The Blitz devastated whole cities, industry, churches, housing. The effects of this relentless and terrifying bombing campaign is almost incomprehensible today. However, the Blitz spirit lives on. But it's often misused. Phrases like keep calm and carry on seem like a bit of fun. But back then, there were doubts. How long could we survive as an island nation alone? Or even continue the fight under occupation? Yeah.